my life, Birdie Num Num, Nipples for Men, coming on a little late here, but welcome to the Abraxas Brief. Yes, I was trying to get this Facebook Live on Zoom, and it was not working. I don't know why Zoom and Facebook Live just don't jive, so I am directly on Facebook here at the Inner Sanctum of Gnosis Group. Welcome, everybody. So glad to see you. Although right now I don't see anybody filling into the chat section, so I'll give a couple of seconds to do this. But it's great to be here. It's been a while since I have been, I have done the vlog, the Abraxas Brief. In fact, I looked and it's been May. Heckin' heckity. Why did it take so long? to since the last Abraxas brief. Well, I'd like to share that with you. Obviously, the content has been a coming. And, uh, oh, there's people are joining in. Vance, Todd, Brett, can you guys hear me? How do I sound? Uh, how do I sound? Anyway, I'm going to assume people can listen to what I'm saying. And, of course, this I will be answering questions for patrons and members of Aeon Byte Prime. But for everybody else who will be listening to this on YouTube, you'll get the you'll get my spiel on the topic tonight, which is politics and Gnosticism. Yes, talk about talk about something heretical. But anyway. Ah yes. The jewel, the mango jewel, how things have changed. All of the sudden, all of a sudden, this is an evil thing, just like that, in a blink of an eye, almost like it's been manufactured, almost like a scare has been created to, I don't know, manipulate the population. But as you'll see with politics, that's pretty much how everything is, society, everything is, at least in the, in the Gnostic worldview, never take the official narrative of anything. I hope you true seeker warriors are figuring this out. And uh, again, why has it taken this so long? Well, let me explain. I will not sum up like uh, The Princess Bride, a movie which they are threatening to remake. And I hope they do not remake. Because uh, again, as uh, it's getting everything's to be a copy of a copy. But anyway, it's been, I looked, yeah, it was May since the last time I did the Abraxas brief. I think there were certain things that were happening why I took this pause, even though I was giving a lot of content. Uh, Towards the end of April, there was a realization that I was sort of trapped in a story, a really huge realization. Like I was stuck in this loop, this Groundhog Day, stuck by Jupiter and Saturn as both were going retrograde. And... uh, I guess we're all stuck, but I realized how that I was stuck. And it was sort of a panic. I think my trigger moment might have been when I was watching, you want to be honest, when I was watching The Long Night with Game of Thrones and the Night King is walking towards Bran. Something hit me that this was me. I felt trapped and I felt I was being chased by certain forces. Needless to say, I panicked and decided I wanted to fight harder than ever for freedom. So I did what the ancient Gnostics did. I threw everything in the kitchen sink, the metaphysical kitchen sink. What is it? What did, what did this entail? Well, it entailed everything. I suddenly started to do the I Ching. I started getting tarot readings. I I picked up yoga. I started going to the therapist. I started uh, doing some NLP. I started uh, writing a lot. I started eating, uh, changing my diet to gluten-free. I just, you know, like I say in the show, find the mystery that works for you. And with the ancient Gnostics was uh, just grabbing a whole bunch of stuff in order, in a way to confuse the archons, because I feel that any sort of uh, institution, practice, uh, religious center will eventually be taken over by the empire. 
So I went a little batshit crazy and I went really intense. And part of it was raising the intensity of my introductions, becoming more unhinged and really going after more guests. I felt uh, they had a voice. Certain guests had a voice, the themes that I wanted to cover this summer, the archons, mythology, uh, um, societal changes, a whole bunch of stuff. And I, Again, I went, uh, you might say, unhinged, intense in uh, Aeon Biden, everything I did. And uh, Frank DeVita did say it wasn't the Archons that were chasing me. It was actually Jesus. But regardless, uh, things, and of course, there were, as always, there were things in life that were happening. There was uh, uh, my daughter Ellie needed a couple of surgeries, still does, uh, oral surgeries. There was there was death, there were some financial issues, and uh, there was just a lot going on, and I plowed ahead, and suddenly I feel uh, all of a sudden really alive, really full of energy, um, really uh, like I've broken through, and I feel that I've broken this narrative I was stuck in. Now, what does this mean? Well, it could mean I'm crazy, but it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, whether I was stuck in a narrative or not, or chased by Archons or Jesus himself, it's all about the narrative that I decided to embrace. And this, in this narrative, I felt I was becoming free and I felt free. And in real life, I do feel better than ever and freer than ever. Uh, what did I always say? Write your own gospel, live your own myth. Sometimes it, maybe it means creating some histrionics. Maybe it's literal. It doesn't matter, but I feel, uh, again, better than ever, freer than ever, healthier than ever. And I feel I have been the most productive in giving you the content, that uh, Gnostic heresy that I hope is helping you out in this different, uh, in any aspect of your life. So with all of this said, uh, the Abraxas brief kind of got, uh, well, it took a three-month break, and uh, I am back because, as always, bringing you the content is not about me or my views. It's getting you those uh, scholars and provocateurs to your attention, giving you that gnosis so you can find the mystery that works for you, so you can find the recipe, the narrative you need to take to free yourself and your mind around you, everything else. So um, that's where I've been, and that's why there's a break. And that's why we're here talking about politics and Gnosticism. And I thought I would restart or get back to the Abraxas brief uh, with something very controversial because uh, in this day and age, everything is politicized. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody is deeply embedded in their politics and has a stance and a view, and it's the end of the world, and relationships are being broken, and people are becoming more. Uh, less tolerant of each other on the internet in real life it's uh again like uh the jewel you would think it was manufactured and i would say it is manufactured i think you true seeker warriors know by now that uh, divide and conquer is how the archons get us every time what did uh carl jung say the devil is forever a dualist he's always turning one into two that's how he gets us. And in these polarized times, politics has become what it is, uh, a very, uh, yeah, the playground of the devil. So I thought we might as well talk about the Gnostics and their views of politics. How are you guys doing there in the chat? Please know I will take questions. I already see Vance, my dear friend, asking a question that will have to wait. Yes, actually, yes, the Abraxas was part of my change. Good eye. I decided to get rid of my persona of Abraxas or separate from it. And that has also brought uh, taking a huge weight off my shoulder, off my back. But I want to answer that in the question section because uh, this is even more personal i feel but uh yeah good call on bringing it up and again glad to see all these people now in the inner sanctum of news facebook group hey mark jefferson from bama sweet home alabama all right so um where the gnostics political hmm let me answer that. Were the Gnostics political? 
No. All right. That's the end of the Abraxas brief. Good night, everybody. And uh, thanks for coming. And <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <clears throat> Most people always have like a nervous cough when I always have some sort of nervous habit. The poisonous jewel. Oh, that poisonous jewel. My God. Oh, what are we going to do with society? Save the children. Save the children. Um, I think uh, the Gnostics historically were not political. They were apolitical. They were certainly against politics for the most part. I mean... Uh, and if they were, if you could describe them as political, you would have to talk to them as, uh, well, you would have to say they were anarchists. As I've said before, uh, anarchism means without archons. And that was the whole purpose and justification of what the Gnostics did and what they thought Gnosis brought to our lives. No archons, no rulers. There's that speech in the Matrix when he was talk, talking about a world without rules, without boundaries, without borders. And uh, everybody thinks it's cool, and everybody kind of overlooks that's like the anarchist creed. And uh, But yes, at the end of the day, they were anarchists, and I would assume that these days I am pretty much an anarchist too. I think I've gone through the whole spectrum of every political view, and I'm sure I might change tomorrow. But uh, these days I realized uh, the state, uh, well, like Neo, a world without rules, controls, boundaries, where everything is possible is where I'm at. I'm done with the God of this world and his systems. And I understand for many, for many that could be kind of scary. It's like, Mo, what about the roads? Mo, who's going to get the law enforcement? Well, I believe that all systems are corrupted by the Demiurge, but I do have faith in human innovation and our divine spark. It's like many of you, when you first decided you were going to step away from your orthodox backgrounds, I'm sure it was very scary. It was scary for me. It's like, whoa, I got to move away from the skirts of Jehovah. I got to move away and get away from my church and my community and... I got to see the world that was supposed to be taking care of me as what it is, this uh, very amoral place with its own agenda. That's, that's, that's scary. But I think for many of you, it's worked out very well. You became spiritual anarchists and you sought out other places to be and maybe you found other homes and so forth. But the point is that when you broke away, it was pretty scary. And it seemed you could not live without the structure, without the comfort of uh, orthodoxy, of uh, Jehovah and all the gods and their communities that they offered you to your life. But you took the leap. Same in politics. And certainly the Gnostics saw that. They took the political and um metaphysical leap away from orthodoxy right into anarchism uh, the world of uh yeah the world of possibility without rules without controls without where everything is possible and um that doesn't mean there were uh, the joker from uh from batman or something like that dude. um but they definitely saw the world as it was and when you see the world as it is then you see the possibilities that are there. Um, there are some examples that you find in the Nag Hammadi library, and it always comes about down to the uh, central Gnostic theme. Uh, go for the infinite things, as the Sethians say in the Three Stellas of Seth, and don't take the temporal seriously or get attached to it. Nothing new in esoteric practices. For example, the tripart tractate, in it, Jesus says, those, however, who are proud because of the desire of ambition and who love temporary glory and who forget that it was only for certain periods and times which they, they <clears throat> excuse me, which they have that they were entrusted with power and for this reason did not acknowledge the Son of God, they will receive judgment for their ignorance and their senselessness, which is suffering.
And then you have like the dialogue of the Savior where Jesus does say, the governors and the administrators possess garments granted only for a time, which do not last. But you as children of truth, not with these transitory garments are you to clothe yourselves. Rather, I say to you that you will become blessed blessed when you strip yourselves. And that's from, obviously, the Gospel of Thomas, strip your clothes. Don't uh, wrap yourself in the societal expectations and uh, government uh, rules and so forth. So very much from the Gnostics, they were anarchists in their view. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this, this sort of sensibility appears in the writings over and over again. And then, of course, you have to look at their structure. If you look at the work of like Hall Tossig and Nicholas Denze Lewis, a uh, professor at Brown University in her book, Introduction of Gnosticism, scholars like these say that uh, much of the Gnostic writers is one big polemic and satire, not against uh, Judaism, paganism, and Christianity, which were they were rejecting big time, but against the Roman Empire itself. I mean, uh, the Archons was sort of a honorific title that the rulers, administrators of Rome would get. Same with it, and same in Judaism too. The Demiurge, as I've mentioned before, before the Gnostics came around, was pretty much, uh, well, not the God above God, but he was a pretty powerful God. He was uh, the architect in Plato's Timaeus. He was a, a very hallowed figure. Um, and uh, again, to uh, mock these, to uh, make fun of these and make parodies of these figures was uh, definitely a giving the finger at the Roman Empire and all of its structures. And, of course, you see other ways that the Gnostics show their anarchist uh, vibe. For example, changing scripture, rewriting scripture, deconstructing the very holy texts of the Greeks and the Jews and the Christians. That was, uh, talk about a sin. There's, uh, when you have the argument... Uh, between uh god what was his name oh my god i'm forgetting i might have to loop back to this one uh not philo of alexandria who was the great christian mystic god i might have to look it up now freaking out ta -ta 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 -ta. Who was the great Christian mystic he even castrated himself so he can be a eunuch as the new testament says and he believed he was also condemned for reincarnation. And I cannot believe, and he had these great uh, arguments with the pagan philosopher. Now I'm going to have to loop back unless you guys know in the chat, because uh, talk about a mind fart. But it's Friday night, and I'm all right. So anyway, going back to the Gnostics, they, were, they definitely showed a anarchist vibe from their writings in different ways. Again, these scholars start breaking down how many of their texts are mocking of Rome. They're obviously mocking the Jewish priesthood. They're mocking the nascent uh, Christian church, those empty canals and those bishops that are made fun of in places like the Apocalypse of Peter. And, oh, there's the answer. I knew it. Yes, you've, thanks a lot, Mark. It's origin. Origin and his debates with, uh, was it uh, Celsus or Celsus? Uh, even Celsus uh, agrees that the Gnostics have crossed the line because they are changing scripture. He may not have liked Christianity, but Celsus believed that the Old Testament should be left alone. And the Gnostics certainly feel that the way. Anything was a world without rules, without boundaries, without control. Everything needed to be destroyed or put on his head it's like um jesus says in the gospel of Tana, thomas i have cast fire upon the world and now i watch it burn kind of like heath ledger's uh, anarchist joker in the dark night in the movies so <clears throat> excuse me let me clear my throat thanks for that one and uh you can see the vibe again, even in their creation myths. 
as uh, Gordon White, I think, said very astutely once, he said, tyranny needs centralization to thrive. It's pretty much, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for the empire, for the demiurge, to be able to create a surveillance state, to be able to, to control your thoughts, your movements, and fate. Well, reality has to be centralized. I mean, this is pretty much a fact. And any system that gets away from anarchism, which could obviously socialism, bureaucracy, uh, fas fascism, and all that is going to be centralized. As uh, Einard Thomason said, maybe in the Valentinian system, there is no archons. Uh, everything is an aspect of the demiurge. Every archon is the demiurge appearing in a certain form. Very much like uh, you know, how the agents appear in the Matrix, where they can just pop out into any human being, and ultimately they're all part of, really part of the architect. I guess Agent Smith tried to rebel. But <clears throat> so, needless to say, tyranny needs centralization. And uh, one thing the Gnostics were not were centralized. As April DeConnick talks about, they were all about the small lodges. They were all about reaching these gurus in Egypt who possessed the ancient wisdom of, uh, well, of Egypt, Egyptian mysteries, and they would become the, these lodges would become, again, the Hermetics and the Christian Gnostics and the Sethians and the Ophites. And you can tell that there were many of these lodges because the church fathers are talking about them. You could tell that they had splits and schisms and then they just kept moving on. And I've always thought that was, again, the Gnostic anarchist view and the distrust of all the, well, of all the structures of this world. Because as I say, and that was a reason why I went on this sort of a strange kitchen sink binge, and I plan on changing it as I go. My mysteries will change because I believe, yeah, maybe yoga works today, maybe the... Um, Maybe the I Ching works now, maybe my therapist works, but it will eventually be corrupted, and so will any institution I go to. I've always liked the John Lennon vibe later towards his life after he'd been disappointed, where he basically had this attitude of uh, join a group and then jump out before they become corrupt. I think John Lennon got the Gnostic vibe. I mean, it was, uh, what did Eric Hoffer say? I have his quote right here. No, I've got it. Where's that Eric Hoffer? Yeah, I thought I printed it out. Da, 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 da. Hmm, interesting. But anyway, he talks about where's that Eric Hoffer thing? Oh, there it is. Sorry, looking at my notes. Eric Hoffer said. Uh, Every great cause begins as a movement, becomes a business, and eventually degenerates into a racket. So needless to say, Gnostic is, and maybe Gnosis itself, it's a term limit movement. Always change, always be shifting as fast as the hologram of the empire is shifting over you. And uh, that's my attitude, but uh, whatever, as uh, my friend Jim West says, whatever works for you, just make sure it works, and that's the key, and that's why you need self-knowledge. So anyway, you have uh, in the Gnostic myths, the great, uh, when the world falls, you've got the centralization. you got Jehovah, the Demiurge, Yaldi Baldi, he's the center, he controls every aspect. And the Archons are just reflections of him. They are everything that are taught. Two plus two equals five. Uh, like uh, in 1984, like O'Brien tells uh, Winston. And the whole universe has to follow the 2 plus 2 equals 5 because that's what they want. Centralization, control, a world with borders and boundaries. So when you also look at the Gnostic myths, when the aeons are falling and they are spreading out, and of course an aeon in its true form is not just time, it's a place. It's a personification. It is a multidimensional. These aeons are falling and they're basically working together 
in, you might say, a community, male and female, all working together, all different, uh, you might say, dimensions, housing all the ideas and potentials of the God of mind. So the perfect world, the perfect reality, the Pleroma is, well, I guess closer to anarchism, or you might say, what's a movement I like? Uh, agorism, that sort of uh, socialist anarchism that I'm kind of into. And then basically one of the tenants says, if you want to screw over the empire, well, do something that hurts the empire. And in our world is growing your own plant, building your own furniture instead of giving Amazon money. Just every little action that helps others, that helps the community around you, that defies the, the capitalist oligarchs and the centralized government and the bureaucrats, uh, that is rebellion. What's, uh, what do I say? The awakening of any individual is a cosmic rebellion, which of course I borrow from Clark Emery's famous quote, the awakening of any individual is a cosmic event. So, as I think I'm proven, the Gnostic myths, the Gnostic attitude shows uh, that they are against politics. Uh, try not to be political. Try to go for these eternal things. And if anything, go the anarchist way. Go the Neo in the Matrix way or the main character, V for Fendetta, where you can, what does he say famously? People should not be afraid of their governments. Government should be afraid of their people. And we are not there. That is not, and we need to get there as soon as possible by rebelling against the empire with our, our creativity and those small acts of rebellion, growing our plants, making our own clothes, uh, selling stuff away from the market, and so forth. And yeah, uh, the movie Before Vendetta is... I mean, it's it's okay, but when you read Alan Moore's graphic novel, it is Alan Moore's exploration of anarchism and how it would work out. So, highly recommend you read the comic book if you've only watched the movie. How's everybody doing in the chat? Do, do, do. I haven't pissed anybody off. I haven't pissed anybody off. Good, good, good. Good, 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 good. Birdie num num. Birdie num num. Oh, better not say that. Is it, uh, I'm, I love that movie. But yes, uh, Peter Sellers, one of my favorite act, probably my favorite actor. I think he's a, he was a genius. He certainly wears brown face in uh, the party. So that was in the 60s. I think, I don't know if he had an excuse. Probably, I think it's always offensive. Oh, I thought so as a child, it was pretty offensive. I guess not when I was watching the party because I was so young and it was Peter Sellers, but uh, with Trudeau. But anyway, Bertie Num Num. Let's, uh, let me look at my notes. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Oh, yes. And of course, the Gnostics, going back to the Agoras Anarchist vibe, uh, they, as I mentioned, they were, it was all about the lodges. It was always about the small groups, the community, the egalitarian community, and where everybody had their own role and sometimes would, would change their role. We, uh, many of you probably know uh, the famous quote from, uh, I believe, I think it's Irenaeus or Tertullian against Marcus the Magician and his coven and how they were democratic. They would draw lots and um, one person would be a bishop one day, the other person would be doing the baptism and it didn't matter if they were men or women. So that's, again, that Gnostic anarchist vibe. Uh, and, of course, you've got um, uh, the, this one is Tertullian, where he's bitching about the Gnostics. Uh, and, again, he says, the very women of these heretics, how wanton they are, for they are bold enough to teach, to dispute, to enact exorcism, to undertake cures. It may even to baptize. Ooh, well, yes, that's what women were doing because... In their view, it was all about your spirit and how you could uh, support and promote the community. So, as we can see from the Gnostics, they were definitely against bureaucracy, against centralization, against bureaucracy, and against most systems and religious uh, entities of the planet. I think I'm, yeah, I, I keep driving this home, but... Um, 
Yeah, it's important to know. However, however, we do have two important. Let me get my jewel. Oh my god, my 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 my, my, my lungs are turning to crystal. Oh my god. All right. Um, we do have two occasions, famous occasions, where Gnostics were not only political, but changed an entire kingdom to their politics. Two. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Actually, another one, but we'll get to that. One was Bardisanis. And uh, I'm going to read from Stefan Heller's uh, good book, Gnosticism, Ancient Tradition in Ancient Tradition of Inner Knowing. New light of the ancient tradition of inner knowing. It looks backward on the camera. I guess I could have just read it like that. But anyway, I'm going to read for the book. Let me know if that's okay. Does that bore you to tears? Uh, are you getting triggered? Let me know. I am trying to do this to please you because... All I want is for you to be free. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm going to read from Stefan Heller's Gnosticism about Bardesan of Edessa. Let's see. Bardesan was born in the royal city of Edessa on July 11th, 155. And he died in 233, full of years and full of honor. He was a confidant of the Agbar dynasty of Edessa, whose crown prince he befriended early in his life. When the prince ascended the throne, Bardesan stood at his side as his advisor. Like many a generation later, Bardesan converted his king, and with him much of the kingdom, to his faith, which was a Gnostic form of Christianity. Edessa was most likely the first Christian state and the only Gnostic state in history. Now, what about the virtual Alexandria? Anyway, after some decades, the Roman emperor Carcalla, bastard, deprived the Agbar king of his throne. Bardesan eloquently defended the Christian religion before the Roman authorities, so that even the hostile Epiphanius was compelled to reform referred to him as, quote, almost a confessor. Bardesan was a man of great culture and learning. He traveled to Armenia where he contributed to the local Christian literature. He was also familiar with the religion of India and wrote a book about it, from which the Neoplatonist philosopher Porphyry subsequently quoted. Bardesan obtained a well-deserved high reputation as a writer on the Christian Gnosis, a master of Greek style and rhetoric. He wrote many books in Greek, also in Syriac, all of a poetic and inspiring style. A list, a list of at least some of his books is extant and includes such titles as The Light and the Darkness, The Spiritual Nature of Truth, The Stable and the Unstable, and Concerning Fate. Only fragments remain, unfortunately. Bardesan is also known as the original narrator of the Christian genre of the hymn, that is, religious poetry set to music and sung during church services. He authorized a collection of 150 hymns written somewhat after the fashion of the biblical psalms. And some think that uh, there are uh, theories that Bardesan was the the author behind the hymn of the pearl. And uh, he certainly was, uh, as some have said, he also might have written the Acts of Thomas. He was perhaps, if you want to know his theology, certainly leaning to the Valentinians. Uh, again, as Einar Thomason said, uh, the Valentinians might have started in Syria with Valentinus stopping there. But anyway, uh, la, 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 what else? And yes, as Stephen Heller continues to write, Bardesan's teachings were apparently not regarded as particularly heretical within his lifetime. And um, you now Stephen Heller continues to talk about Bardesan, but he was definitely a very influential, elegant, erudite figure who, uh, as Stephen, has, Stephen talks about, created the first and only really Gnostic state. Not really, because now we go to number two. 
And as uh, I was just reading, or as the book says from Stefan, that is money. Money in the jets. So now we go to money, not too long after. And I shall read it for you. Let's see. Let's the let's talk about the second Gnostic political figure. The prophet Mani was undoubtedly one of the most remarkable individuals who ever lived. Born in 216 AD in Persia, present day Iran. Iran so far away. Yeah, I'm sure you've never heard that joke. Anyway, present day Iran into a family that was related to the formal royal house. He went into exile with his parents at an early age. It seems that Mani's parents belonged to the Gnostic-like religious group, possibly a variant of the Mandean faith, or more likely an Elkisite community where a young boy he would have been exposed to the Gnostic worldview. In the manner of a true prophet, he had a visionary experience of his own that disclosed to him the future mission as the founder of a religion. The first of these visions occurred when Mani was only 12. At this time, he was contacted by a godlike angel called the Twin, who asked him to withdraw from the religious community where he and his family lived. And it's interesting, in the Pista Sophia, Jesus, very much like Mani, meets his twin, who uh, tells him he's got a mission. So you wonder if the, Pistis, the Jesus in the Pista Sophia is sort of uh, written after Mani, since it came le- later. According to his own report, Mani received the major doctrines of his new religion at the time. When he was 24, the angel appeared to him again and instructed him to begin his public ministry. Mani returned to his native Persia, where he eventually befriended King Shapur and his son, the later King Hormizd. I'm saying that right. Um, Hormizd. Soon after the proclamation of his mission, he journeyed to India, where he made some disciples, but also made with resistance from the Hindu population. He also journeyed into Central Asia, where he spent several years in Western Turkestan, one of them in solitary seclusion, communing with heaven. So eventually, Mani made it to uh, back to Persia, and his early greatest early success was uh, the new faith that uh, became a challenge to the Zoroastrian priesthood. The leaders of the Zoroastrian community began a powerful campaign against Mani and his religion. And remember, that's... um, Okay, let me continue writing. Their intrigue bore fruit when the young king Horsmood, a devout friend and disciple of Mani, died, and his antagonistic brother assumed the the throne. Mani was seized, subject to many indignities, and finally died in prison on February 26, 277. His disciples, who secretly managed to visit in prison, reported that he was surrounded by angels and that he shone like the sun. I don't know about that. But anyway, Mani was brutally killed. And as uh, Jason Reza Georgiani very well argued in our last show, it seems that the the prince of Persia or the, the ruler of Persia before he died and was very friendly to Manichaeanism and was spread allowing money to spread Manichaeanism across uh, the empire. He was think he thought that Manichaeanism was really the perfect global egalitarian religion that could bring together the world at the time the what's the name of the were they parthians or assassinians i think they were assassinians but they were they were i think they were whatever the parthians they were spreading and rome was sort of uh, falling back so if you wanted to create a truly global religion that could integrate all these religions together well, Manichaeanism would have been perfect because, as many of you know, it was, uh, like many Gnostic groups, it's uh, very syncretic, very parasitical. It can change shapes. Again, many could incorporate Buddhism and uh, other and paganism and Christianity. So Manichaeanism might have been uh, really a global religion, but again, things didn't work out with Mani when the prince died and his successor was charmed by the Zoroastrian priesthood, and bang, uh, Mani became a martyr. Uh, 
a Gnostic martyr. And uh, well, those were the two, those are the two main examples of when Gnostics <clears throat> became political and when entire nations for a very brief period became Gnostic. Probably wouldn't have worked out. I don't think it could ever work out because again, it's really not uh, two things that can go together. Now, how are you guys doing there? Everybody happy? Yes. Um, so the other example that I might be able to think, I mean, think about, and um, you could say, I mean, I don't know how you could say that the Cathars were political. Yes, they, prefer, they befriended many of the Catholic royalty, and then they fought the Crusaders, but that's a diff, sort of a different story. Now, the other example, and this is something Robert Price brought up, is uh, the Frankian Jews, the followers or Neo-Sabbatians, uh, they were influential in bringing down the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And that's the one time, I remember Robert Price, where you can say this was Gnosticism being very political, moving the social-political um, tectonics of the world and really changing history. I don't, uh, I don't really want to get into this now. It's something for the future. I remember um, Yaakov Liev, uh, may he rest in peace. We had planned our number four show of uh, Kabbalah for heretics, and we were going to deal with Islam in that era and how the Frankians influenced it. But uh, sadly, um, we never got to number four. So it's something I definitely want to talk about because it seems everywhere I go, I'm hearing about the, suddenly the new boogeyman of the world are the Frankian Jews and uh, Shabbatai Sevi's uh, followers down the road and all that. So this is something maybe I'll ask uh, Nicholas Laos because his book uh, really uh, covers that period. But yeah, for a future show. So those are definitely the examples I can tell you about Gnosticism. And uh, even if you say that the Franken Jews, which I don't subscribe to, are dark, there are, you might say, aspects of when politics and Gnosticism work together that are indeed dark. And maybe it's the great lesson that politics and Gnosis should not work together. And I used to be very resistant to... Uh, Scholars like Eric Vogelin and so forth who would say, oh, the communists were Gnostic. Oh, the Nazis were Gnostic. And I thought it was complete bunk. Mm, not anymore. I think, uh, especially watching the lectures of John Vervaki or Vervaik in his uh, great YouTube series, uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, and uh, doing my own research, I think uh, Vogelin might not have been that far off. I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, you tell a group of people that they're not that they're scum and that you rule them, but tell a group of people, you know what? You really are gods trapped in an unfair system. You really are supermen who have been oppressed by the powers. Uh, all you need is our special type of knowledge, and you will realize your full divinity. And you'll get some nice uniforms and all that. And then we will sort of wind you up and let you loose on your own projected shadow and tell you they are archons and i think this formula this what i call it weaponized gnosticism just works very well and i think when you look at movements like uh, national socialism and others i think we have some weaponized gnosticism and you can certainly talk about other as i've talked before very successful weaponized gnosticism movements uh, scientology again what's their mythology we are trap beings on this planet by the evil god uh, Zeno or whatever he's called and uh, we know L. Ron Hubbard used to tell his uh, followers early in the game this is a Gnostic religion and they would use the word Gnosis and I've given other examples in articles and in shows so the point is is that uh, politics and Gnosticism when they meet are pretty dark 
and this weaponized Gnosticism is pretty powerful. Uh, it does change the world. It does create effects, and it seems a lot of them are mostly negative. So it's something to watch out for. I mean, I would have to agree with Eric Davis and Chris Knowles in their work where they talk about today Gnosticism isn't even have to be metaphysical. It's becoming completely political. I know people got mad at uh, Chris when he talked about how Antifa could be considered a Gnostic movement. Again, think about this. You tell people not only that they are oppressed, but that they are somewhat semi-divine, that they have some great destiny, that they can reach their godly potential and that they're they're surrounded by these arconic forces this wickedness in high places and then set them loose so i would have to again agree with eric davis and chris Knowles on this one so this is something really to look for it's something to keep out and i'm going to keep banging the drum on this because again this is not saying gnosticism is bad again talking about the classic gnostics about mani and bardes and we're talking about how they rebelled against the empire the roman empire or the whatever the hologram yeah the hologram was how the empire decided to manifest itself in the hologram. But now we're talking the sort of weaponized Gnosticism in modern times and uh, how it keeps uh, reloading in the 20th century up until now into the 21st century. And I see it uh, happening even more. But I am here to expose it. In fact, I am here to give it a platform. Yes, I know, I know. That's like a dirty word these days. Why are you giving a platform? Why are you giving a platform? Platform, platform, platform. Well, because I believe that we need to expose these and we need to bring it to the light. If we don't bring out our shadows, if we don't bring out all the shadows that are in our collective consciousness, then that's how things begin to rot. That's how the shadow gets projected against innocent minorities. So I want to give more platforms to different views of Gnosticism so that you, the listener and the viewer, my dear true seeker warriors can have that information when that Gnosis, that Gnosticism is weaponized because it will be weaponized against you. I mean, I always, uh, I always thought in my head, well, what would happen if let's say, I don't know, Richard Spencer or Louis Farrakhan suddenly had some, great insight about the Nag Hammadi library and it inspired them and all that. Would I have him on the show? Yeah, I would want to interview him. I want to understand. I would give them a platform because I want to understand how they got there. I want to understand how you might say, are they interpreting this gnosis, this Gnosticism and what they plan to do with it. I want to bring this out into the light so that, that we can all become more conscious. So, so that's been one of my, uh, definitely one of my initiatives this summer is trying to understand weaponized Gnosticism and trying to bring it out, trying to give it a platform and try to understand it. Besides the usual scholars and provocateurs that I hope are showing you the mystery that works for you and only you just as I found all these crazy mysteries and I have found a narrative that has uh, made me more free, more alive, and uh, certainly with more energy and see what uh, the powers and principalities ha are have to throw at me later. She see where the hologram shifts and uh, decides to try to confuse me. Will I be faster than the shifting hologram or will it get me? I don't know. But uh, right here, right now, as Jesus Jones saying, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here and I'm truly grateful to be serving you here in the desert of the real. It's been an honor and I love bringing you this gnosis. I love showing you where this weaponized Gnosticism might be so that you can see it. I'm glad to bring it all out so that nothing gets repressed. And in the light of knowledge and consciousness, we can all work together to dissipate what is dark, what is temporal, and we could all become more unified and stop letting the devils of politics split us apart, forever turning one into two until the human race is so fragmented and atomized and all the divine sparks 
will be forever buried in darkness and it will be the end of the human race. At least that's the story I'm sticking to right now as I write my own gospel and live my own myth and I hope you are too. Anyway, this has gone a lot longer than I thought. Uh, so we will end. Yes, sunshine. I am the most diplomatic person ever. Oh, like Bardes and Armani, I try. <laughs> and Valentinus, they were respected in their times. It was only afterwards that they were vilified, but they're certainly unifiers, and they certainly brought a lot of light. And I hope to be a fraction of who they were. And I'm glad you are here, sunshine. But uh, this is the end. So now we will go to the questions. And this will be for patrons and those who subscribe to AM Byte Prime. Please subscribe. And uh, let's keep growing this Red Pill Cafeteria because we've got some amazing guests coming in the fall and topics. We will be talking about Mary Magdalene. Uh, is reincarnation real? The left-hand path. Um, some uh, really some amazing topics. The God Mithras. I mean, yes, uh, I will keep up the intensity as long as you are keeping me company as we give all these controversial topics a platform. Mm. oh those are my lungs turning into crystal but anyway for those of you who won't be joining the question thanks for being here and thanks for being yourself and now let us know if you have any questions <laughs>